Hi, everyone. Uh, before I get started, I, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so up until a couple of years ago, I lived in New York City, and I was working for Bloomberg. And Bloomberg has been a, a big sponsor of the uh, Python open source ecosystem for a few years. And uh, I think we should all uh, thank them for that and for these great venues and, and all the help that they, they've given to the community. Um, and after uh, Bloomberg, I actually moved back to France and studied a company called Quantstack. And what we do is build uh, scientific computing open source software for uh, corporations and laboratories, etc. So as an open source developer, I've mostly been involved in Project Jupyter. I'm a steering council uh, member of the project, and, uh, but I also work on other things, uh, such as the extensor C++ uh, tensor algebra library, and some visualization libraries built on the top of Project Jupyter, such as BQplot, PyP3.js, iPy leaflet. Uh, so yeah, uh, if you uh, want to follow me on Twitter or GitHub, I am Sylvain Corlet uh, everywhere. Um, and uh, after my talk, uh, you can ask me about Python, obviously, C++, JavaScript, uh, and Project Jupyter, as well as Extensor. So yeah, I'm one of these people who like Python so much that I actually write code in other languages, such as JavaScript, for Project Jupyter to let people make a better use of Python. So I spend most of my time do writing code in other programming languages. Um, a lot of what I'm going to show today was, is not just a one or two or three person project. It was built upon work from a really big team. And so here I'm just showing uh, the core developers team of uh, Project Jupyter as of 2014. Um, but we're missing a few folks on there, as well as other people who, are who have developed some of the other things that I will be, I'll be showing and were not on the picture. And I thought I should really uh, include them. Um, so before I uh, show even more, I should probably make a quick poll in the audience. Uh, first, can you all understand my Americanized French? <laughs> you can, apparently. Uh, second, who has used or n knows about Project Jupyter in the audience? So pretty much everyone. And uh, who knows about Project Jupyter interactive widgets? Maybe half of the crowd, okay? So if you know about Project Jupyter, you probably have heard of the new front end for Project Jupyter that I'm going to use. Most of this talk is going to be made of live demos, uh, which is risky, uh, but uh, I like taking risks. So, but I'm going to start with something very simple. When, pro when IPython, uh, which is the older name of the project, and the early versions of the notebook came out, some people didn't really see the point. They were essentially saying, Jupyter is merely a glorified replacement for the REPL, for the, for the, the console uh, interpreter. And so what really happens when, for example, if I type nine times nine in the Jupyter notebook and it returns 81, is that I am modifying the Jupyter notebook object model, sending an execute request to the kernel that may be running on another machine through a protocol that was fully specified the kernel response with the result of that uh, computation modifies the document model, and then you see the result. And even though there is a lot of things happening under the hood when you hit nine times nine, it's fairly instantaneous. And as a user of the Jupyter notebook, and as a, if I am learning how to program and I want to explore like how to write functions and write simple code, I'm actually the the, the bottleneck in that loop here, in the redevelop print loop. Every time I want to see the results of my computation with new values, I need to enter the new values manually. So for this purpose, when I could start, I could try to be smarter and uh, use a function instead and only have to enter one value, but it's still fairly slow, right? Um, in, to make this easier for beginners and people who are doing scientific computing, um, Software such as Mathematica and Maple uh, had this, uh, and Sage also uh, had this interface uh, called Interact that actually used the introspection features of the Python programming language to inspect the arguments of a function and build an automatic GUIs for you to interact with the parameters of the function and see what is the outcome of that function. So in that case, for the square function, I, uh, if I call Interact with a X as an interval, 
what I, what I get is a slider for the X parameter. And I see the output displayed, which allows me to, much, to go much faster and see how the square function behaves, right? So that ID actually works for even for functions of, of more than one parameters. And depending on the type of the default value, I could Um, I will have another GUI generated automatically, okay, uh, F of A. There you go. So th this allows for building uh, GUIs automatically for a function that you pass, right? So th the first and initial purpose of Jupyter Interactive Widgets, and this is probably not the reason why you use them, was to enable that feature, something that people really loved and used a lot in the Mathematica Notebook and other uh, related software. Um, but the way this works is using something called the Interactive Widgets objects, and widgets are actually special ob objects that when displayed in the Jupyter Notebook are replaced and are displayed in the form of an HTML, like rich representation that you can interact with. So a slider is merely that, for example, is a, such an object. I can read its value, modify it manually from the code, and see it reflected in the front end, right? So what widgets are, more than a bunch of controls also, is a framework to communicate in a bidirectional fashion between the kernel, the part of the code that is responsible for executing the code that you type in the Jupyter Notebook, and the front end. And in, in order to do so, we follow this, the MVC pattern in that every time I display a new, I, when I create a widget object, uh, a counterpart object is created in the front end that is automatically synchronized, and every time I display it, a new view is created. Well, more than just a, a collection of controls, because we have lots of them, what this enabled is actually, is more than, is really a framework upon which you could build. So a couple of years back, I was in a Python conference, and there was a guest talk of a D3JS developer who was giving a tutorial about D3JS. So for those of you who may not know, D3JS is this great visualization toolkit that runs in the browser. And he actually uh, was going through the details of that example that runs on the D3JS website, which is a like interactive Voronoi tessellation. And so there are lots of these examples on the D3JS website where you have like a snippet of code of how you can reproduce that visualization. So I decided to, okay, just copy paste that thing into the Jupyter Notebook, wire it into a new widget, and make it, sorry, should probably re-execute that whole thing, and make it an interactive widget. The only difference with that the example that I was showing in the D3JS website is that now that visual output is wired with the data that I gave from the Python backend. And I can make use of that really nice interaction super easily. And well, that was very simple. In maybe 50 lines of code, I could enable that use case for Jupyter developers and Jupyter users. So I'm going to show a number of custom Jupyter widgets libraries. Some are meant for data visualization and other things, uh, but there is one aspect of it that I really want to emphasize is that if there is anything in the JavaScript ecosystem, a visualization library, or something that is not even meant for visualization, if you want to interface with MIDI controllers or game pads or whatever you want that works in the browser, it is really easy to wrap it into a Jupyter widget and integrate it into your Python workflows. Uh, if, so even if there is nothing in Bokeh or BQplot or PyQGIS that allows that data-driven pink rabbit that you found on the web, you can actually make a package for it fairly easily. Now, there are a few libraries that we've built upon IPy widgets that I really wanted to, to show. Uh, and the first one is BQplot. Uh, BQplot uh, is a project that we started when I was a quant at Bloomberg and we got to open source. So it's on the Bloomberg GitHub organization. Uh, and it's a 2D plotting library for Jupyter built upon the Jupyter widgets ecosystem. And just like the sliders and the other widgets were meant to accelerate that read eval, eval print loop, these are really not only meant for, in, for visualization. It's really also to take user input. So generating some data, and you can use BQplot with an API 
that is very similar to that of matplotlib, but unlike matplotlib, where most of the rendering logic is in the back end, and matplotlib will generate an image that you would display in the Jupyter notebook, here all of the logic for the rendering and the interaction lies in the browser, so that now you can have, you can have something really and truly interactive in the Jupyter notebook. So we have other high-level routines for other types of charts, BQ, um, scatter plots, histograms, etc. More importantly, even every single component of a figure in BQ plot is a widget itself. And you can compose your own figure by assembling the object model, including the scales, axis, marks, etc., with an object model similar to that of ggplot. So in that example, I'm putting together two uh, lines uh, and the axis uh, and tick marks for, for with linear scales. If I change the values for y for that line chart, I see the graph update in real time to reflect the new values. And the same goes for everything. You could modify the, the, the data for a scatter plot, change the minimum of a, of a scale, set it back to none so that it's computed based on the data, etc. Um, you can use BQplot as an, in, as an input uh, widget. So for example, here you can uh, perform a selection of an interval in a BQplot chart and update another chart based on that and see what was selected. Uh, you could use it to draw. Uh, so in that case, um, yeah, you could use it to draw, for example, um, uh, just modify one of these curves. This is really useful if you are, for example, uh, testing a model uh, that takes a function as an input, and you'd really like to know what would be the outcome of your model if the function looked like that. And doing this by entering in like some arbitrary functions and signs and like linear components and also that you sort of see the, uh, reproduce the shape that you want may be hard. Well, here you can really fasten that really by print loop again and have an, in an input that is more complicated. Um, you can also move points around. So, and here I have this uh, really complicated machine learning model that computes the mean of the y positions. <laughs> and as you move the points around the scatter plot, so it's not meant for data tampering, it's like really for an experimentation, you can see how the model behaves. But just for educational purpose, if you were computing the median instead of the mean, you would, you would see how it behaves when you move a single point. So that's for BQplot, but there are lots of others. Uh, beyond BQplot, so we, we can do like fairly complicated applications using BQplot. Uh, Py3.js is a, a bridge between 3.js, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go, sorry. So Py3.js is actually a bridge between the 3.js uh, visualization package that is, runs in the browser and, and, and the Jupyter ecosystem. So in that case, I built a clickable uh, 3D surface with uh, um, markers for the position of the mouse. And the way we built this is by uh, composing uh, the scene entirely, including the position of the cameras, uh, the lights, and the different objects of the scene. So it's not really a library meant for high-level visualization where you would just say plot or scatter and get something out of the box. It's much lower level, but can be used to build pretty much anything. We actually put together a flight simulator using Py3.js with 50 lines of Python in the Jupyter Notebook that was demoed at SciPy a couple of years back. Um, so it's very fast, and yeah, you can do pretty much anything with Py3.js. As I am in the 3D plotting world, I should also really mention IPy Volume, which just like Py3.js is built upon the 3.js library, but provides much higher level plotting routines. So that one is just a scatter plot in 3D with circle markers, serial markers. And since just like BQplot and Py3.js, every single item of this object model is actually a widget itself and will reflect visually the changes in the model as you make them on the Python side. So for example, I could wire this with the IPy widgets color picker and modify the color of the, of the, of, of the object in the scatter plot or the size or whatever you want. Really smooth. 
You can also show animations, etc. So if you want to uh, check out any of these libraries, IPyVolume, BQplot, PyFuJS, you can check them out in Kanda or PyPy, and so pip install PyFuJS should work out of the box for the classic notebook. Um, uh, Leaflet.js. So is there anyone, who in the room would know about the Leaflet.js JavaScript library? It's a small portion of the, of the group. So Leaflet.js is a JavaScript library for visualizing maps. And uh, we actually could wire, I mean, wrap this into a Jupyter widget so that you can enjoy all of these features in the Jupyter notebook. So here is a quick uh, way to display a map with a given center position and zoom level in the Jupyter notebook. You can use this to uh, draw on it, change the layers. Um, uh, another interesting feature of it is that you can, for example, decide to uh, right click on the output prompt and uh, create a new view for the output so that the map would be displayed uh, on the side in a different tab of the doc panel and so that you don't need to scroll back and forth all the time to see the results or the outcome of your ex execution of cells. Uh, there is also the sidecar widget, uh, which allows for using the right uh, tab, tabs <laughs> to have a more rigid layout where you have only a single map displayed on the right. Um, well, uh, I don't have so much time, so I should probably just really mention quickly the, uh, the, um, some of the applications or things that you could be building with BQplot and, uh, and uh, IPy leaflet. So that screencast here is an application that we built uh, during a hackathon last year in San Francisco where we were analyzing the well-being of uh, the population in different neighborhoods of, uh, of San Francisco. And depending of their, I mean, we were like sort of measuring the, and trying to make the link between the, the self-assessment of their satisfaction, depending on their neighborhoods, and some other uh, actual features of their neighborhoods, in terms of uh, average distance to restaurants and things like this. Since I only have three minutes, I guess, I really wanted to mention another initiative that we've been working on is that one of the main extension points of Project Jupyter is the kernel infrastructure, where you can have all of this is actually a language agnostic. It's not just for the Python programming language. And over the past year, we've been working on a kernel for the C++ programming language, uh, making use of uh, the Kling interpreter that comes out from CERN. Um, so you can do pretty much anything that's valid in the C++ programming language, uh, such as function classes, polymorphism templates, C++ 14.11 support. We can do quick help, just like with uh, the uh, Python, with question mark, std vector is actually going to fetch the help for std vector on CPP reference. It's not a gimmick that actually works for pretty much anything in the standard library, but also user defined, ty defined types if you declare them in the proper way. We can do rich display in C++, etc. But more than a kernel for C++, you have time more. <laughs> Uh, it's actually a framework that, uh, so Xus is actually a framework for building uh, Jupyter uh, kernels uh, that should make the work of kernel authors much easier in a way that will enable them to use all of these features, including quick help, autocomplete, um, interactive widgets, and whatnot. Yeah, so. Uh, I'll be taking a couple of questions. Yeah. That's right. So I, I think the notebook, the classic notebook is used in production by a lot of people. So it's going to be in maintenance mode for some time, for quite some time. Um, in terms of uh, 
when the 1.0 for JupyterLab is going to be released, I'm not going to uh, give or make any promise for the date. Uh, we've released a beta version uh, about, about two months ago. Uh, there are a few more things that the team wants to integrate into JupyterLab before it's released. I see a lot of requests for styling the widgets. It's like, oh, I don't like the drop down. It's pretty ugly. I need to change the style. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. Any plans for the committee to make that easier rather than going to CSS like JavaScript? Um, so in the past, we allowed uh, custom CSS for pretty much anything. And we decided to uh, not allow that anymore because that was making the entire DOM structure of all the widgets part of the API. Because any anytime we would change it, people it would break people's work. So we decided to enable a whitelist of attributes that you could style for each widget. And if you uh, want more, uh, open pull request to enable more. But it's more of a whitelist than like a full uh, open access to the CSS of the widget. Yes? That's right. Uh, not PDF at the moment. So the question was whether we could embed uh, widgets in a way into PDF documents. Well, obviously, you're going to lose the interactivity. <laughs> so at the moment, it's possible to have a static embedded widget in a web page. Although in order to use it, this is going to require access to internet to get the JavaScript from a CDN. Uh, you can put it on your blog, and in the live documentation. Uh, if I go on the IPy leaflet uh, documentation, Um, you are going to see live widgets displayed. Uh, so you can embed them in static web pages, but not in PDFs. Um, oh, sorry, what do you mean? There is a one-click solution, yeah. In the classic notebook, at the moment, in the widgets dropdown, you can see, do export to HTML. And you will see all of the uh, widgets uh, that are on the, in the notebook displayed vertically in a vertical layout. And then you can arrange that layout as a, however you want. We don't have time, Sally, for more questions. Thank you very much.